myself, Paul Rudd, the star of Ant Man, mm-hmm. plays Scott Lang, yeah, Ant Man, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, our producer at the time, Brad Winderbaum, and then mm-hmm. it must be said, Kevin Feige, the head of Marvel, yeah, all comedy fans. Mm-hmm. They all know who Tom Sharpling is. Oh, look at that. Wait, uh, say that again. I missed, I couldn't hear what you said. I think my headphones might be shorting out. So we, uh, we sh- there was a scene in the original Ant-Man mm-hmm. uh, where Scott Lang is buying a lottery ticket. Did not make the final cut of the movie. And was that because... Um, I will just so. say, I, I remember seeing your performance and thinking like, this guy, is, this guy could be the mm-hmm. new Danny Aiello. Please. So then the, the call comes in for Ant-Man and the Wasp. Uncuttable. Yeah, uncuttable. Until I cut it. <laughs> uh, have there been any talks about you returning for a third film in the series? And if you do, will you be cutting Tom Sharpling from that movie too? <laughs> <laughs> it was actually, I think it was Michael Douglas. Uh-huh, I yeah. think I told this, uh, I, I, he's like, <laughs> yeah, Peyton, who, who was that uh, the guy in the audience talking about it? T- Sharpling. I said, well, Michael, it's Tom Sharpling. He's, a, he's an old friend. We shot a thing for Ant-Man when we had to cut him. And was just like, Jesus Christ, this guy's your friend? <laughs> and, uh... Yeah, so that happened. Didn't make it to Ant-Man and the Wasp. Okay, yeah. This is actually serious right now. Yeah, okay. So this, the scene we were planning to shoot, yeah. which, which was going to be, this is not a spoiler, but it was going to be in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, we have had to cut. So... And this is serious. This is serious. I should not have done this you live. Done I'm this sorry, man. But we so there's yeah. there's a couple of well, options. This is gonna be a fun rest of the episode. I so no, but hold on. Yeah, I feel like you're actually in shock right now. Oh, I really am. Um, <laughs> look at that. Is the I get a thing. Look at the screen, and then I look at the screen, and it's <laughs> me being <laughs> breaking news. It is breaking news. Thank you for the. Thank you for the news. Uh, this is the, the, oh my goodness. You got it, baby. Chest pains in the middle of the night. Want to scream. Oh, what's the point? Everything falls on deaf ears. The times are out of joint. The birds don't sing no more, and the crickets have all gone mute. Squirrels want you to run them over. It's like they finally know the truth. Hard time. Hard time for you to stay, my friend. Hard time. Hard time. Hard times don't ever end, my friend. Turn it off. Turn it off! Turn it off! Turn it off! <laughs> Doctors have turned to murder. Anything for a buck. And if you don't like it, baby, that's just your tough luck. Politicians fed lies. They're so corrupt that they creep. Dust flies from their barren mouths every time that they speak. Bar time. Bar times are here to stay, my friend. Bar time. Hard times don't ever end, my friend. You don't know what hard times are, Daddy. Hard times are when the textile workers around this country are out of work and got four or five kids and can't pay their wages. The fish are drowning. Everything is in dismay. Nature is an upheaval. There's a cataclysm every day. So say what you feel, not what you ought to say. Nothing comes from nothing. No one will hear you anyway. Hard time. Hard time to hear to stay, my friend. Hard time. Hard times don't ever end, my friend. You want it darker? You got it, baby.
Hello, best show. Hey, Tom, it's Todd Dishi here in Newbridge. How's it going? Oh, pretty good, pretty good. How are you, Todd? Good, fun show, just, just, have, just having some fun. Um, I have uh, something to add to the topic, if that's okay. Yeah, please. I would love it. All right, so these are minor resolutions that I, I, I think I can pull off. Um, number one, I need to stop taking naps at 2 in the afternoon. It's ridiculous. I'll, I'll sleep for like 45 minutes. And then I'm, I'm up all night, you know, and, and from 1 to 5 a.m., pretty much it's basically just Skinamax City, you know? Uh, uh-huh. Okay. So, so, so that's the first one. Sure, because the, the naps, just the, the front half of that, the naps are doing what to you? The naps are keeping you, like, like you're getting too much rest at a time yeah. that just got you. Okay. It, yeah, it's a weird time. So then, you know, I'm, I'm up all night and, you know, <laughs> frankly, what, what else is on TV at, at that hour? And it's, you know, it's the, it's the devil's business basically. So it's not, it's not healthy. Oh, uh, yeah, it's not healthy. Yeah. So, uh-huh. so that's one. Uh, mm-hmm. Number two, I need to stop obsessing over my dumb thoughts all day. Like example today, I lost three hours of, of productivity because I was just lost in this dialogue I had, which was basically, you know, I wonder how much knowledge of pop culture the average Pope has. How much knowledge of pop culture the average Pope has? Yes. Like, for example, do you think it's conceivable that, and I think, I think his run was like, it felt like it was 20 years or something that Pope John Paul II was at least aware of Van Halen. I'm going to say he, he did not Pope John Paul II was not aware of Van Halen. What do you think was the, like he might, I know he was aware of Dylan, right? Didn't Dylan play some like show that he was at? I think there was, I think Dylan did. Yeah. I think, I would bet that the the Pope John Paul II was aware of the Beach Boys and the Beatles, right? The Beatles, I can, yeah, I can see the Beatles. I, the Beach Boys is tough, though. I wonder. He must have. Yeah. Well, do you think he knew who um, Led Zeppelin were? See, that's that's where we're getting to the good stuff. I don't know. I mean, oh. Stairway to Heaven. I would picture he he heard stairway to heaven at some point somebody probably brought it to his attention like oh and he thought oh this might be a cool cool religious song right and then he hears those solos and the solos are so long yeah although do you think he do you think he would feel like the drumming was a bit much or just right i think he would i i seriously think he, he would say you know I think it's pretty cool that Bonzo lays out at the top for, for quite a while. And because because the, say, there's the one fill when Bonzo is like, right? Oh, I think he was, who wouldn't be blown away by that the first time they hear it? I'm sure, I'm sure at some point, if he did hear Stairway to Heaven, at, mm-hmm. at some point in his reign, he was drawing those three rings somewhere. <laughs> Sure. A notebook or a Bible, don't you think? Uh You think he just has a, I think he would just have a normal notebook that he'd just be sitting there listening to like the bishops talk. Right. And he's just doodling and just drawing. You think he might draw the guy with the lantern that was in the gatefold? I think he would see that as as sorcery. Sure. you're, You're probably right. Yeah. So, so maybe Led Zeppelin, John Paul II would know. What about, what about like, uh, do you think he knew who Queen were? I think someone probably brought that to his attention because it looked like it might be operatic and, you know, the, the leotard that he would wear, it looked like it was probably almost in his wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. You know, and then he yeah. hears Ogre Battle or something. He's like, no, thank you. Yeah. He, but he might have considered like that 
Hey, yo, right? Like the, the crowd, the back and forth. Oh, maybe, but I don't know. I kind of doubt that. I don't know. I can yeah. picture a younger deacon or bishop bringing that to him and having him just shoot it down hard. He might all, but he might have responded to John Deacon's name too. Oh, here's one of us. It's true, and it'd be like, "No, your your holiness, he is not an actual deacon. He's the bass player. He does write some. He does write a lot of the songs, though." Ah, uh, he wrote the hit. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think he would know? Uh, I'm in love with my car. I think he would think, "What does that guy have in his mouth that makes him sing like that?" Ah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that that's a pretty interesting thing to think about, but I get it. It's too it's too distracting for you to just have your brain contemplating these things all day. You can't talk to me like that. Wait, I'm I'm just trying to bring up a point. But oh, why, well, okay, well, you know what, Todd, well, Todd? Why can't I talk to you that way? Because I'm number one on Twitter. That's why. <sighs> okay. You're number one on Twitter. How? Well, well, what does that even mean, to be number one on Twitter? Check it, check it out. Forget that bean dad guy, all right? He's yesterday's news. You need to get on the Taco Bell Todd train. Taco Bell Todd? Yeah. What it was? Yeah, oh, I I really don't like how confident you said yeah. Well, get used to it because there's like nine hundred more coming. Oh, great! Yeah. Wait. So you're in the entertainment business and you don't know about Taco Bell Todd? I do not know about Taco Bell Todd. Todd. Wrap yourself in because I'm all over the socials today. All right. Here, here's the deal. All right. So. Yesterday, this super impromptu thing happened at the Taco Bell drive-thru on Muffler Row. Basically, what happened was a, a certain someone told the server, you know, as they were getting, getting their food, that they were going to pay for the car behind them. And then, what do you know, that person pays for the person behind them, and so on and so on. And this thing went on for like five hours. And it, I'll tell you, man, it was so impressive and, and inspiring. And, you know, especially in, in these, these times that we're in, you know, these cataclysmic events that are happening. And, you know, people are doing stuff like that. So that's, that's pretty cool. Well, you know, I got to say, I'm impressed by that. That is, uh, that is pretty amazing, and um, I guess I'm assuming since you're Taco Bell Todd, you are the person that got the ball rolling, that instigated the whole thing, which is pretty cool. What? No, I, I was the one who stopped it. But you stopped it. Oh, yeah. So it had been going on for how long? I think like five or six hours. Yeah, and then... You decided to just take take your food for free, I guess, right? You got a free. Well, yeah. Well, 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 dude, why should I have to pay for the guy behind these crunch wrap Supreme? Well, what am I made out of money? Well, it's not like you're made out of money. I mean, if you're eating a Taco Bell, it's it's all relatively affordable. So, not what I. No, what do you get? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, that, that seven layer? Yeah. I get a 42 layer. Oh, great. So you get six, is that six, seven layers? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's more of like a, it's almost like, you know, those giant uh, bulldozer tires? Mm-hmm. It's like that thick. Why are you ordering something that thick? Because I get hungry. You get hungry. Okay. Look, look. I've been on a tight budget ever since all my music gigs went away, okay? I said it. Okay. All right. Well, look, I'm sorry if you're 
you know, if stuff dried up because of the, you know, all this. So I'm assuming you're you're a touring musician who everything with all the COVID has just had had your your whole, you know, uh, livelihood kind of turned upside down. Oh no, I I mean I've been on a tight budget since my band got dropped from uh, Geffen Records in 2001. Since your band got dropped by Geffen Records, yeah, in yeah. 2001, nine, 20 years ago. Yeah, 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 uh-huh. yeah. Oh my God, what a, what a story that is! No, uh, let's. Okay, can I hear some of it? Yeah, yeah. No, there it is again. Okay, great. I was I was worried you forgot about doing that. <laughs> no, oh my God, no. And I'm inspired. That's what I say. So check it out. We were called Power Scrunch 69, and that, that scrunch with a K, of course. And of course. I don't know. You know, s- s- small-minded people would probably call our music new metal, but I like to describe it as the heavy power funk. The heavy power funk. The heavy power funk. Duh, uh, duh. I'm sure accent on duh. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's interesting because we were one of the very last bands of, of, of that scene to get a big record contract. Okay, of, the, of that whole scene. Yeah, yeah. So we got signed, and you know, we're trying to, trying to find a producer, and we can't get Fred Durst from Limp Bizkit to produce our, our album because he's, he's too busy, but we did record some tracks with his father, Frank Durst. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. And I'll be honest, truthfully, Frank was an auto mechanic and had no interest in or knowledge of record production. But our our manager, Rupert, he convinced us that most people would think it said produced by Fred Durst on the back cover. And that would account for at least 50,000 copies of our debut album, Don't Be Afraid of the Dank, to be sold. Mm -hmm. But people would that people would buy it mistakenly. Yeah, they just see F. Durst on the back. Oh, my God. Well, that's got to be, gotta be Fred. So mm-hmm. Fred st- Fred's approval is good enough for moi, right? Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, he really was the arbiter of greatness back then. That When he came out of that, when he came out of that giant toilet, the first song on that tour, mm-hmm. the Family Values tour, oh, my God. Yeah, now that was a real, st- <laughs> real statement. Yeah. They they should have had a giant plunger come down. Right? It's true. Yeah. So so we finished the album and, and you know, thing, things were looking really good. Mm-hmm. But then things started to go really wrong, Tom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, how how, so, how there it is. Okay, great. Thanks for <laughs> only, only how many more to go? It's about 800 and I think about 894. <laughs> okay, yeah. Great. yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, you got three quickies there. Yeah. I get them quick sometimes. So, okay. all right. First thing that happens, I can't believe I'm telling you this story. I, I lost my wallet while we were making our big budget video for our first single kiss my sickness. And uh-huh. For, re- for reasons I'm still unsure of. Yeah. I, I, I was pretty convinced I knew who took my wallet. But, Tom, please don't make me say who I thought it was. I'm going to ask you to please tell me who, who, to, who you think took your wallet. No, seriously, please don't make me. I'm going to ask you, please tell me. Scarlett Johansson. Who? Scarlett Johansson. How and why would Scarlett Johansson have stolen your wallet from the video shoot? Um, well, she, she agreed to be in the video as a, a pretty much a giant favor to her friend, the director of the video, this guy named Giles Kapperman, who, of course, was the guy who did all those big new metal videos back then. And, um, all right, full disclosure, I, I hadn't slept in probably five days because of my flagrant blue addiction. And when I couldn't find my wallet, I got it into my head that she took it. 
and I, I made a huge scene in front of everybody, crew, band, label, everything. I'm yelling and I'm screaming, and I, I called her a hack actress who had to resort to stealing people's wallets to support her crack habit. I, I seriously, I, I had no idea who she was, and I didn't mm -hmm. realize that she was blowing up because of, you know, her performance in Ghost World. And, oh, my God, it was insane. And she was furious. She walked. The director walked. And then about 10 minutes later, I, I find my wallet. Yeah, you found your wallet. Where was your wallet? It was hidden in um, one of the uh, pockets of my giant. <laughs> I dropped my wallet. See, <laughs> See look. It, but I dropped doesn't, my stop, doesn't stop for you in your wallet, does it, Todd? Oh, my God. Oh. It's so irony just come and stab me in the face. Yeah. Uh, so basically I, I found the wallet in, in, in one of the pockets of my giant new metal jeans. Sure. Which I'm sure you had so many pockets. There's like 18 pockets, you know, and, and, you know, you're wearing this giant t-shirt also. So you, you don't even know where the pockets are. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, so it was so much easier to accuse someone wrong, wrong, wrongly of stealing it than to check all those pockets. It was a pocket I didn't even know I had. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but uh, she was so mad about it, and I swear to this day, I heard she still talks about it. About this wallet? About what I did to her. She doesn't remember my name or the band or anything, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so that, that was the first thing that went wrong. The second thing, our drummer, Derek, got shot in the arm in the middle of a show. Okay. How did, how did your drummer get shot? All right. Basically, it's the, it's the warm-up show for a big record release party. And we're in the middle of our third song. And all of a sudden he just kind of stops playing and we look back and he got shot in the arm. Nobody else in the band got shot and we had no idea what was happening. Shows canceled. It turns out it was Derek's 78 year old downstairs neighbor, Milt, who did it. Who shot him in the arm. Yes. Yeah. And basically what happened was Milt shot him because he was seeking revenge for all the years he had to endure Derek practicing above him. Okay. So he decided to exact his revenge at the big show. It was like he, he had followed Derek's progress for years. Uh-huh. And, and knew about the, what was going on with the band and chose that night. It was pre it's pretty ingenious. No, it seems like Milt, Milt had a real knack for, for the moment. He did. He really did. So, anyway, you know, Milk goes to jail for I, I don't know, like five years or something. So, for a seventy-eight-year-old, that's I mean, that's that's a that's a that's some serious time. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty. That's pretty rough. Yeah. So the final nail in this coffin was when um, was when this video emerged of me doing something. Okay. And then before you knew it, we got dropped and everything got pulled away faster than a Glade plug-ins TV commercial director saying, great, now let's grab a, a few of you just dancing by yourself in the kitchen, okay? Now, Todd, can I just, when you said you, there was video of you doing something, what, what, what do you mean doing something? Oh, we, seriously, we don't need to get into this. So anyway. Um, no, 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 no. If you're going to tell every detail of the story just what what do you mean you said doing you were caught doing something on video all right well well basically somebody and i'm willing to bet my my dog on this that uh it, it was scar joe paid someone to lurk in a tree in my backyard and and basically video me doing one of my erotic tai chi sessions and look i'll, I'll freely admit that that tape, which was heavily edited, I, I, I might add, can seem a bit shocking to anyone who's not connected to both their body and their inner eroticism. Okay. 
Yeah. So it can be shocking to watch you do your erotic Tai Chi. Yeah, I mean, there was more to it than that, too. But, um, okay. But, well, like, what, what, what do you mean more? All right, look, you're probably going to have to have to bleep all this, okay? So, all right, so basically. Okay, I'm ready. All right, what I, I'm, uh, what I was doing on this tape was. And that's pretty much it. Well, I just got to say, um, wow, I guess I got to, um, that was, although it was barely sexual. Right. And also seemingly physically impossible what you just said and i did bleep pretty much all of it um that's right that you're okay it's also in- astonishingly disturbing so and the the true downside of this whole thing is that i am truly afraid that i'm never going to be able to stop thinking about it that's that's what other people who, who've seen it have told me they they said that it's like a um it's like a video equivalent of this thing i don't know i don't know if you remember it but it was called the magazine back in like the mid 2000s that was floating around yes yes yeah. the magazine oh my god i haven't heard about that in years oh i'm still having nightmares about something i saw in the magazine yeah, but now now there's two things I'm not going to be able to stop thinking about. Right, I know. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, well, thanks for getting one of those in. Also, um, so you you um you said that the tape was heavily edited, though. Oh yeah. What was it actually heavily edited? No. Not at all. Mm-hmm. They actually took some of this disturbing stuff out of it. So they actually, the edit, any editing that happened softened. I would say by like thirty percent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Todd, I gotta say this is very troubling. What I'm what I'm hearing, but it's also um, it's like eerily reminiscent of uh, another Newbridge, uh, infamous Newbridge resident, uh, Reggie Monroe, who was the, uh, he was on Survivor, on one of the seasons of Survivor, and got kicked off because they caught him doing something uh, pretty, they caught him with the doing, a, like, I was it? I forget how he referred to it, but just doing something inappropriate out in the jungle. Yeah, Reggie's my second cousin. He's he's a super cool guy. I can't believe you know him. Yeah, Reggie's called the show way too many times. Um, kidding. Oh my God. Reggie's your second cousin? Yeah, yeah, super cool guy. You know, he took me to my first Merle Allen and the Merlins concert. Merle Allen and the what? Merlins, the Merlins, like the like a wizard. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's um, it's this solo thing he does. It's really pretty good. It's it's like G rated wizard concept power pop. The it's brother awesome. of the brother of G G Allen. Yeah, yeah. Has a has a, a like a wholesome power pop band. Yeah, it sounds like the Greg Kim band, but but like some of the songs are like I got my wizard cap on and I'm taking you to the roller rink. It's almost like a, like a less hard Reuben Ooze. Well, as long as it's as long as you're taking the edge off the Reuben Ooze, there right? 
that's some of their stuff is sick. <laughs> some of their stuff is sick. Some of that. I was talking to my my friend uh, Jake Bugelmus uh, mm-hmm. about it, and like we both agree that like side two of Back to the Drawing Board. Oh my God, that's like Slayer or something, uh, subject matter wise. <laughs> we both agree. We did. Yeah, we both agreed. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So. So basically, that was my brush with the cruel reality of the rock and roll business, right? Oh boy. Yeah. Well, that's uh, you. You definitely. Uh, you definitely got a lot of uh, crazy stories out of it. Got my got my licks in, or, or did someone get their licks on me? I'm not sure how that's. But anyway, the good news about all this. What's that? I started writing songs again. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. 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 And. You know what? Yeah. I think I've got it even more than I had it in the first place. Like, I, I'm still a total badass when it comes to writing top shelf jam kickers. I may be in my mid 40s, but, you know, I can still tap into that, that darkness and, and that rage that basically just makes us human and I can channel that in, in the song so heavy they make Lamb of God jealous, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's, that's pretty, that's, that's, that's some intense music then. Very intense. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any chance I, I could hear one of these songs? Oh, boy. Uh, you know, I, I'm not in the studio right now, and I, I, I don't have my act with me, but, um, you know, I could probably I could probably sing a little bit of, of this one tune I, I, I'm super proud of that I God, I'd love for either Ozzy or, or, uh, or Danzig to record. I think they could really, really do some good stuff with it. Um, Basically, this this tune is about my my very passionate yet very volatile marriage uh, uh, to my wife Sheila. It's uh, it's interesting. We're both like super headstrong alphas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, basically, it goes like um, I couldn't believe you ever agreed to go out with me, and I can't believe you love me. I know I don't deserve you. I'm always thinking of you. And I wonder if you ever think about me. Wait, is that, is that, that's one of these, what's that? Pretty cool, right? That's, well, it's, no. Um, that's what you were saying. You were saying, you were saying how heavy it is. And that's the, I got to say that is the that's really so reedy and 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 sp- kind of spineless and very needy like the quality cuz you're talking you're talking like such a tough guy and what was that line about about your wife if she ever thinks about you what was that yeah, I wonder if you ever think about me. Because I said I was always thinking about her. She, she's kind of distant. I mean, she's been really distant for about, I don't know, 12 years. Mm-hmm. Okay. But look, well, well, other stuff you're talking about, it, 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 it's called vulnerability. You should, you should probably look into it. And, and by the way, I want to say I was the first person to tack look into it onto a retort, okay, just, just, just for the record. Uh, I'm really not sure about that, but... Um, Okay, I'll. What do you think? I I sound like wimpy in it. Yeah, yeah, I think you sound really wimpy in it. All right, well, check it out. All right, rule number one: chicks love it when they think you have emotions. Well, that's that's such a gross statement. Well, my landlord says it's true, and he was in Aerosmith for a little bit. Chicks love it when they think you have emotions. Just let, let that sit for a second. Okay. <laughs> and I don't want to talk about your landlord. Your landlord from what's what's his name? Rick Dufay. From formerly of Aerosmith. Yeah, I think he's on Done with Mirrors. Mm-hmm. Oh, Rock in a Hard Place, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the golden era. 
<laughs> Absolutely, yeah. He turned me on this amazing song that, that uh, for, for God knows why, Aerosmith won't record. It's, it's amazing. It, it's, it goes, uh, popcorn bowls, popcorn bowls. I sure do miss Grandma's popcorn bowls. I mean, that's like a number one hit. Yeah, well, that's that's um, yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, God bless him. I guess your landlord there must be some building over there with. Hey, you can't talk to me like that. I'm sick of this. Okay, why why can't I talk to you like this? Because I was the star witness in the Dante Cernalino murder trial. That's why. The da- wait, hold on. The Dante Cernalino murder trial from back like. 16? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. That one has to count for like five. Fair enough. Okay. Um, that trial was huge. Right? That, yeah, that was like, I mean, I'm a little fuzzy on the details. I haven't thought about it in so long, but that was such a big deal back then. Like, well, could you, would you nutshell it for me? Well, okay. Uh, summer of 2005. And uh, I was, you know, out of the rock biz by now. And I'm, I'm getting into my AMC Prancer after auditioning for the role of Martin Daniels in the Newbridge Community Playhouse production of Clifford, which was a whole thing. Because I, 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 I knew I was going to get this role, but I didn't get it because I kept messing up the play's most crucial line. Basically, I, I'm sure you don't know the story, but Martin's fiance Sarah, wants to have kids. And she doesn't think that Martin's up for it. And he, but he says, I, I love kids. And, and uh, as proof, he, he says he gets along great with his nephew. And then Sarah says, oh, what's his name? And Martin says, I want to say Morton. But I kept messing it up and saying, I want to say Mason. So I didn't get the gig. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, no, I think you got it right. Wait, what? Are you serious? What's the line? The Morton, yeah. Oh my God! I, well, I should get that role then. Maybe mm-hmm. I can sue. Um, maybe maybe you could. Do you sue think that's it? real? Is that the best use of your time? I think so. Yeah, I mean, our president does it. Yeah, well, that that means you should do it too. I think so too. Anywho, get, getting back to the story, you know, I'm I'm about to get in my car, about behind the playhouse, and I drop my Hoobastank one hitter, and um, it rolled underneath the car, mm-hmm. and so I'm under the car, under the car, and I'm trying to reach my mini ganja vessel, and, and I see these three sets of feet about 15 yards away down the alley behind the playhouse. Basically, what's going on is these two tough guys are roughing up this other guy about some blue deal gone wrong. And the guy that's getting roughed up, who turned out to be Bryce Prefontaine's older brother, Bryn, he's pleading, going, don't barge me, please don't barge me. And now, I was a religious viewer of the real mob wives of Port Newbridge, so I instantly recognized the main tough guy as Dante Cernalino, the Mm -hmm. underboss of the Newbridge mob. So I'm terrified, right? Mm Mm-hmm. I'm just scared. So Yeah. But but I'm under my car still just kind of watching this. And Dante goes, and and this is very strange. He he didn't speak with the same low, powerful voice he he used on on the show. It was this real high and breathy voice. And he was going, oh, we're not going to barge you. Don't worry about that. It was almost like Bill Stevenson's imitation of Frank Nevada. Yeah, that's a little something for any P.O. Box Warners out there. So next thing I know, Dante and his henchmen exsanguinate this Bryn guy right there on the spot. And this thing was straight out of Exorcist 3. They drained all his blood into these little cups without missing a drop, and they left it behind for the cops to find. It was the most nauseating, impressive thing I've ever seen. Yeah, that's, that's, that's brutal. It's pretty sick, right? So Yeah, that's, so that's way I'm, up there. I'm terrified. My wife, Sheila's terrified, and she insists I do not come forward to the police. But, you know, with the knowledge that I'd be doing the right thing and 
also knowing I could now afford to build the fully detached man cave of my dreams with the reward money, I knew I had to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. The inter the inter and so there's a big trial. And the interesting thing about this trial was it was Judge Montgomery Davies second to last trial before being disbarred for operating that device under his robe. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, what is that was such an odd, an odd setting to, to, to be in that court, you know, and I, I don't know, I, I think most of us thought that tapping sound was being made by the court stenographer, just kind of typing away, and I guess we all just chalked up that, that deep whooshing sound to, to being an air vent or, or something, and, but I, I'll tell you, I really couldn't pinpoint what the ensuing loud thud was, but my, my prosecu uh, the prosecutor told me not to think about it too much or I'd, I'd probably, you know, get really upset and just, it would overtake my thoughts, you know, like the magazine overtook my thoughts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, the trial goes just as prevailed and Dante got put away for life. So all's well that ends well, right? Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty uh, intense, um, wait, um, Hey Todd, you know I'm thinking back on this. So like you talk, I haven't thought about this in years, but you talking about it, it's like kind of like triggered a whole lot of memories here. And I think mm -hmm. in that in that trial, <coughs> didn't they go to like like to, they they really went to I guess you could say like to great lengths to cover you underneath all this prosthetics and and like alter your voice. Right. Am I, am I remembering this correctly? Okay. Were, were you behind, even like behind some sort of screen even? I, I was, I was behind two screens. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. Took, they took every possible precaution and, and, uh, and it worked, you know, they hid my identity and I'm alive to tell the tale today. Thank God. Mm -hmm. Well, can I, can I just ask one question then? Um, yeah, sure. Why, why on earth are you just, just outing yourself as the, the anonymous witness on the radio? Oh, rock on. Well, I, I mean, you know, I, I guess I just feel like it's, it's been long enough and I don't know, I guess I'm sure everyone's let bygones be bygones and you know, this, this pandemic has, has, has pretty much altered everyone's priorities, you know, so Everyone's just happy to be alive at this point. I don't think anyone's holding grudges anymore. You really think that's what it is? Yeah, rock on. Of course it is. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, but you were the anonymous. Wow. Okay. Can I ask what what is your last name, Todd? Yeah, it's yeah, it's Dishi. Dishi. Well, 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 I'm, I'm, I've never heard that last name. It's a very, it's a very unique name, Dishi. Yeah, it's, it's unusual. It's, uh, my, my bloodline is kind of convoluted, but I've, I've been told it's French Romanian. Okay. And how do you spell Dishi? <laughs> we don't need to do that. We don't need to get into that. Anyway, it's been a great. No, 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 no. Now, now you've piqued my curiosity. Why, why, uh, how do you spell Dishi? It's 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 how you think it's it's spelled. How 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 do I think it's spelled? D i t s h i t. Do that again. Nope. D yeah. D. D. I. I uh huh. Yeah. P as in Paul. Uh huh. S S as in Sam. H I T. Oh, okay. Oh my God. That's that's your okay. Look, and uh, truthfully, I I think some a hole was effing with my great great grand grandparents when they were being processed at Ellis Island, and that's the I'm using air quotes less ethnic name they gave them. Pretty okay. pretty pretty hilarious, right? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a rough that's a rough one. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, well, at least you've got uh, 
At least you got the, your new music to to kind of keep you happy, huh? I do, I do. All uh, all all systems go, and the, uh, like Tim Buck three said, the future's so bright. I got. Oh no. What? Oh no! What's that? Oh my god! Uh, oh my god! Stay on the line. I I I heard some rustling in my bushes, and and I'm looking outside right now. Oh my God! What's oh that? Oh my God! The Colonelinos, the Colonelinos must have been listening to this call the whole time. Mm-hmm. I know, I know they're all huge podcast fans. I, I heard they subscribe to all 346 podcasts about the history and the impact of the Comedy Store. Uh huh. Yeah, I don't feel good about this. Oh are, my God! Are you okay? Todd? Oh, no, wait. It's not the Colonel Ninos. It, it, it's Milt. It's Milt. The, Milt. The one who shot your drummer? Yes, he must be 98 by now. Why, why is he mad at me? How did he find me? And why is he mad at me? Oh, I don't know. I'm so mad at him. All right. <laughs> well, now that I know that it's Milt. Check this out. I'm going to take 16 years of misery out of that old dick's ancient haunches. Hey, old man! You want a piece of this? Well, get ready to have your ass kicked. Oh, my God, Tom. He's got a high-powered laser. Oh, Oh my God! How does a hundred-year-old man gain access to a high-powered laser? Oh, oh my God. Cancel my, my Cinemax subscription, please. Todd? Wow. Well, that one wasn't in my 2021 bingo card. Yeah. I hope he's okay. Sound like that laser sounded pretty powerful. <laughs>